an early musical, was a history teacher actually, but early musical played the organ. And his cousin played the organ very well. And as a matter of fact, his cousin played this instrument that you see in these pictures right here, this console and these pipes. And he used to come from Buffalo, my cousin David, and we would go to hear Brian, his cousin, play this instrument. Well, I had never heard such a thing. And I was gobsmacked. <laughs> in fact, I used to be incredibly, for a while, I would not go up close to the console because these pipes right here in the middle, I was convinced they were going to fall. <laughs> I could not see any, actually you can see if you peek between the pipes there, there is a supporting mechanism in there. But this was First Baptist Church in Jamestown, New York. And unfortunately, and I'm very sad to say that this organ no longer exists. It was lost in a fire. <laughs> the church burned and the whole thing is gone. Um, but this is the instrument that I first took lessons on. And a few years later, I became organist of that church. <laughs> and I had this instrument to practice on. I spent many Saturdays practicing for hours uh, on this instrument. And it, it holds a very fond place in my heart. I'm very, very sad that it's gone. Um, but at any rate, that's, I just wanted you to have a little background about how I came to the order. All right, Mr. A.B. Person, next. The wonders of technology. That's, that changed, but that didn't. Chest, it's called the wind chest, where there's pre the pressurized air is in here. 
and the, most, the, the keys will open a valve that will be beneath each one of these pipes, depending on which one you choose. Uh, and just some, some uh, pieces here, this is called a rack board that holds the pipes, and a tow board. You, we'll get to pipes in a minute because they have, they've been anthropomorphized. They have mouths and feet and ears and <laughs> lips and all sorts of things. All right, good, let's go on. We'll get, we'll get to that later. Oh, now we're going to watch a video, hopefully. And this is from the program How It's Made. Many of you have you sat on the Science Channel at home, you've seen How It's Made. It's as complex as it is Can I just say one more thing before we play it? I think that this video, it's a Canadian program, so we're pretty sure that this video has been made at the Casadan factory. Um, All right, but it's very good, so I'll be quiet. This thing is an instrument. Building one is an incredible feat of engineering and craftsmanship. Early man discovered he could make music by blowing across hollow reeds of different lengths. In ancient Egypt, an engineer devised what later would become the basic technology of the pipe organ. A steady airflow without mouth blowing, while controlling the air to each pipe to create different notes. By the Middle Ages, the pipe organ was a fixture in churches throughout Europe. <coughs> Johann Sebastian Bach composed his greatest works for organ while working as a musical director of a church.
The valves are connected to the organ's keys mechanically by long tracks of cedar wood or by electrical wire. The electric signal triggers electromagnets to cause a sudden air depression, making the trapdoor valve drop down and let the air in. The console is the organ's brain. It contains all the controls for the keys and sets of pipes. The organ's white keys are made of linen wood covered with bone. The black keys of ebony or rosewood. An artisan adjusts the keys using the weight. When the weight rises, the tension is just right. The console, keys, and all the other components are finally put together in the assembly room. After testing, they disassemble the organ and ship it to its destination, where it's reassembled. The voicers come on site to perform what's called tonal finishing. They check and adjust each pipe according to the acoustics of the room. This process can take many months for a large and elaborate organ.
So the visits and organs were noted in reports uh, from early on, uh, and some of the first ones to go west were given to King Pepin, and also one given to Charlemagne. Uh, and here's an example. Oh, no, you saw the picture that he had there just before? Yes. You can't go back? Yes, I can. But, uh... <laughs> Here you see, here's the player. Obviously a monastic, look at the haircut. <laughs> and his monastic brother is working the bellows. Mm -hmm. Has anyone ever seen fireplace bellows? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, okay. A lot, there's, there's really pretty much, the, it's pretty much the same idea. Here we have a really active. Uh, yeah, he's dancing. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a, here's a modern copy of an instrument that would be from about the, the medieval period. And here's your person operating one of those.
uh, factors that made the organ acceptable in worship. I love this. No history of association with immorality or ignorance. <laughs> uh, it was suited for teaching musical and mathematical calculations because the dimensions of pipes match the numerical ratios of pitches. So uh, I guess you know it could be seen as a teaching uh, instrument. And it could also fill large spaces with sound produced with breath through pipes as with the voice. The organs first used in Christian worship may have well coincided with the coming of measured chant. It was not used to double voices or accompany them as we use it now. In the beginning, it played the original chant tune as singers sang the other two parts. So it sort of was an adjunct to the singing. In the 15th and early 16th centuries, it played before the singers, after them, or in alternation with them as a substitute for the singing. In England, organ is known as early as the 7th century. And the, the one that's usually referred to here is Winchester Cathedral. You're bringing me down. No, no, no. You know the song. Uh, so, uh, and the organ of, of this instrument, it was said, it was considered large for its time. It had 400 pipes. Our organ will have 2,019 pipes. So I don't know what they would have thought about our instrument. Uh, there, the, the organ in Winchester had 26 bellows. So you just saw an instrument that had two, right? 26 bellows played by two organists on two keyboards of 20 keys each and had an exceedingly powerful sound. Uh, and it's also worth mentioning that organs at this time were built mainly by priests and monastics. So something uh, sort of an interesting fact. Um, all right, and then the different countries started to develop different styles of organ building. Uh, the first one is called a block there, and most instruments were called block there. And what that means is there were no stops yet, and we're going to get into what stops are. In fact, this is probably the time moment for you to tell me what those are. Um, on a block there instrument, whatever pipes were there sounded. So if you played a note, you got everything. Not, not, not all the pipes at once. You got the pipes that were designated for that key. But it might be four or five different pipes that are sounding when that key is pressed. And those key and those pitches were picked on purpose. They would have been pleasing to your ear. Uh, so that, that, that was the instrument known as the block there. And then the Italians, Agostino. We're the first to develop stops. Okay? An organ is strange because to, to make it sound, you need to pull a stop. You need to use a stop. And you stop. You, you think it would be called a go, but it's not a go, it's a stop. And the reason it's a stop was because for this very reason right here on the block there, what they wanted to do was the ability to shut off different sounding pitches that they didn't want so that they could be selective about the pitches that they did want. So that's where the word stop comes from. Um, and it came in the first, that's supposed to be half, first half of the 15th century. Spell word. <laughs> German, the German and Dutch were the first to develop large instruments. Blouse. Uh, more than one keyboard. And it's interesting, I showed you those other earlier predecessors of the keyboard and the porta team. And the, what they started doing was they had a we would have had a big instrument to play louder, and then they had one of these four keys sitting off to the side to play softer. And then somebody got the idea, why don't we put another keyboard and then we can play we can play both of those without having to go like this. So uh, that's how the that's how the uh, more than one keyboard started. And then of course the pedal board. The German and the Dutch were famous for that. The English did not have pedal boards on their organs until the 19th century. They were way behind. Way behind. I'm not sure why they didn't adopt it, uh, but they didn't. And uh, there's a wonderful story about an instrument, or a, a person who was auditioning to be an organist of this church. And since they didn't have pedal boards, they tended to be sort of high pitched and squeaky sounding. So this person that was auditioning got the idea 
he took a pencil or something and stuck it in one of the low keys on the organ and then he improvised over that note. And guess what? He got the job. Because <laughs> they hadn't heard that sound before. Uh, organs come to North America. The first uses of organs in America. This was news to me. San Felipe Mission in New Mexico was one of the first places where, where an organ was used. And of course, you know, we have the Catholics coming to uh, colonize. Uh, and Santa Fe, New Mexico is another place where uh, early instruments were found in the United or in the uh, what was then wouldn't have been that would have been Mexico, but now it's the United States. And then Quebec, of course. Uh, with the uh, Roman Catholic missions there as well. They brought pipe organs with them. The first American builders were David Tannenberg. He's a famous one. He came from Germany, was a Moravian, uh, and settled in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Many of you probably know about the Moravians there. Also, they have a big uh, settlement in North Carolina. Well, Mr. Tannenberg learned how to build organs, and he was building organs here in the United States starting in 1728. And then I also mentioned E and G.G. Hook. Mm -hmm. uh, there were many other, I'm sure, earlier organ builders in Boston, in the Boston area, um, but he's a famous one, so I, I wanted to make sure it was list him. And then the organs were first electrified circa 1915. I have some interesting stories, though, I want to share with you. I'll try to make these brief, but I thought you'd appreciate these. Uh, in 1708, wealthy Bostonian Thomas Brattle, and I'm wondering if Brattle World Vermont isn't named for him, he was a Puritan, imported an organ for his house. When he died in 1713, he left it to his Brattle Street Puritan Church, which rejected it. <laughs> he anticipated this and provided that the Episcopal King's Chapel would then receive it. Their acceptance made it the first permanent organ installation in a New England church. Uh, within the U.S. Uh, would become uh, 1703, the Wissahickon Pietists and Swedish Lutherans. I have to get a word in for the Swedish Lutherans. <laughs> <laughs> Probably first used in organ. By 1800, there were about 20 organs in New England, mostly in Episcopal churches. I have an exclamation point there. <laughs> Puritan scruples against instruments in church continued well into the 19th century. Uh, here's a, here's a, this, I love this story too. Uh, this is the Ox, talking about the Oxford movement. Uh, now, our clergy can set me straight on this if I'm getting mistaken, but I believe the Oxford movement within the Anglican church was an attempt to get back in touch with the Catholic roots uh, of, of the Episcopal church. Uh, and from the beginning of that, which started at Oxford University, as you would might imagine, uh, two, these two men, John Mason Neal, he sang some of his hymns, by the way, and Benjamin Webb began what was called the Cambridge Camden Society. It was an ecclesio ecclesiological society. The society began with architecture as its chief concern in churches but quickly bumped into church music because organs and choirs take up space. It gets better. <laughs> Already in volume three of the society's journals, organs were discussed in not a positive way. Church music, it was argued, was almost entirely vocal. Organs are unnecessary and maybe negative. They cost money, which could be spent on art and architecture. They require organists who cost, who cost money. <laughs> And they turned churches into practice studios and concert rooms. It was agreed that the occasional and judicious use of an organ can increase the grandeur and propriety of public worship. But if organs were permitted, they should be placed at the west end of the nave. In other words, <laughs> get it out of the chancel, get it away from it, get it away from it, right? The west end of the nave, uh, or at either end of the aisle on the ground. In other words, away from the altar. When Neil's opinion that the choir should be in the chancel became normative, however, guess where the organ went? <laughs> it went to the chancel, too. Yeah. So, wonderful story. Uh, and a, another side note on that Brattle story of, uh, from Boston was, um, I think it was that same one. Anyway, someone had proposed that they would, no, it was, a, it was another church that was going to get an organ. I think it was a Puritan church. 
Someone proposed that they did at Oregon and they were going to give the money for this for the instrument. Well, someone else said that they would give just as much money to have it thrown into the harbor. <laughs> <laughs> so organs have been, you know, uh, what's the word? Controversial. Yes. Just a, a quick note on King's Chapel um, in Boston on Tremont Street. Uh, it is now a Unitarian um, denomination, but they still use the 1928 prayer book uh, once a month for Holy Communion. Um, so we're considered radicals among the Unitarian Church. I bet. <laughs> yes, okay, so we're onward to the different, two different types of pipes. Uh, and there are two different types. Two, one's called flute pipe. And on a flute pipe, it works basically like a flute or recorder. If you examine this part right here, if we tip that, like here's the eyebrow, yeah, I have a visual aid. I didn't steal this. Uh, way back in the 70s, I got to tour an organ factory in Buffalo, and these were old pipes that they were giving away, so I took one. Um, but there is a, a, if you would hold it this way and blow into it, this part right here we, is also on a recorder. I should have had a recorder so you could see it, but the, it's, it's very similar uh, in that the way it produces a sound. Wind comes through, it's divided by this, it comes through in a thin sheet. I'm going to pass this around so you all can take a look at it. And that thin sheet of air is split by this, what's called the upper lip. Now you start learning the parts of the, the pipe. Well, it's, it's not on this slide. But you'll, 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 get, you'll get to it in a minute. It's right there. there. It's oh, it is? It's right there when, it, when my first turn is. Is it first from the left? Oh, yes, but there's no, it's, there's no words on it. This is called the foot, the toe, the foot, and here's the mouth. And later we'll see some examples of, this is called the upper lip, upper lip and lower lip. And here's where the air comes through. The air is split by that upper lip. And then you're going to see a video in just a second of a guy that explains this. But the air is divided between inside and outside. And that's how we get tone. Uh, now, these pipes have stoppers. That makes a difference because you can have open pipes and stopped pipes. And we're going to have both on our instrument that's, that, that we're, that's coming. Uh, they may be made from wood. They also are made from metal. The open pipes, is, this is an interesting thing. Um, when the pipe is open, the length of it results in a certain pitch. And as you, when you put a stopper in the end of a pipe, it lowers the, that pitch by an octave. Ooh, really? So, so you can get a low pitch out of a pipe that's not so long. Uh, so that's what the stopper does, is it, it uh, lowers the pitch. And then, of course, you can tune the pipe. You can change that pitch. Let's see if I can demonstrate it. It's got to blow into it first. Yeah. And then if I pull it out a little bit, you can hear it's lower in pitch. Yeah, it would change. If I if I took it out entirely, Scott just fixed the lower. Except it's made out of brass. 
And what happens here is air enters the bottom of this pipe. Re this reed, it sets that reed into vibration against this thing called a shallot. And that's just a cylindrical tube. And that tube is connected to the pipe at the top, which in this case is called a resonator. And that produces the tone. You have two ways of tuning a reed pipe. One is to shorten or lengthen the top part of it. And the other is to change the position of the tuning slide, the tuning wire. And that goes up and down on the brass reed. Uh, so that gives us our clarinets, our oboes. The chorus reeds are more like trumpets and trombone. And they're, you know, when you, when you and it's sort of funny because you don't think of a trumpet or a trombone being a, a reed uh, for folks of us who play orchestral instruments. But if you think about it for a second, the way that a trumpet and a trombone makes a noise is you buzz your lips. You know, you do that in the mouthpiece. So it's not a whole lot different from a, a reed vibrator. All right, let's go on. I think the next video is how pipes work. This guy gives a very good uh, explanation. Love music. So how does the organ pipe work? The way that this works, the air comes up the boot here into this little chamber, and we can take the screws off. See how it's constructed in here. So the air comes out here, and this piece in the front that I took off has a pocket scooped into it. So the air comes out and up, and there's a very small gap here to create a sheet of air to come through. And then this is sharpened on the end here, so that sheet of air. Uh, will initially come outside and then some of it will go inside. It gets split and as that air pressure goes in, it goes all the way to the other end of the pipe, hits the stopper, it gets reflected back and then the pressure wave comes back to the front, it pushes all the air out and then there's going to be more pressure outside than inside so then there, that uh, lower pressure wave comes back in and su sucks that air sheet back into it and so this air sheet wobbles back and forth very quickly depending on the length of this pipe. And that's why the pipe length uh, determines the frequency that the pipe speaks at. Sometimes you also see grooves notched in the mouth area here on the pipe. You can see the grooves that are notched. If you look, look right inside the mouth. Yeah, the pipe like this is rather easy. The stopper moves in and out and that adjusts the overall length so that you can get an accurate pitch on the whole pipe. There are, of course, different kinds of pipes than the wood ones. This one is made of metal. Uh, it's a tin lead sheet that's rolled and soldered, uh, so you don't want to eat it. But this one, of course, will make a sound as well. This one's actually a stopper, and you can change the pitch by moving the hat up or down. Did you pause the video? Oh, no, there are hey, 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 yeah, just, a, just a little bit. If you can roll it rolling back just a little bit. Yeah. Anybody guess what these things are called? Here's your here's the mouth. Lower lip, upper lip. Here's your ears. Those are the ears. And actually, I think we're not in quite the right place. Um, on some pipes, you'll see a little piece of wood that goes across the front of here that's uh, a cylinder, and that's called the beard. Now he's going to do the reed. Why there are reed pipes such as this one? Uh, this is a, a reed, just like a clarinet might look, or a saxophone. It has a weight on the end because it's a very low frequency one. And as the air comes in, the pressure forces this closed. But then with no airflow, it springs open again. And so the vibration is set up. This part here is connected to here is a tuner that allows the pitch to be adjusted. Let's see what this sounds like. Well, you get a low, you'll get this one a little bit like a cow. <laughs> just, uh, this guy all the way down. 
So the size is protecting the metal from, from any melting or anything we got. Kevin, I'm surprised how many one of the processes. And stands up with uh, some kind of automated system. the size and that would be taken off of course. A modest little instrument. <laughs> Oh, good for you. I like these puzzles. 
fellows. Thank you. 
rechts is boven gegaan. Hij mag nooit uit het, uit het balk lucht halen. Dus ook nog wel wat daar nog aan is. Dan kun je zien dat het balkje is naar boven. Dan mag ik niet boven gaan. En dan, dan is het gericht voor de speler. Thank you for being here today. 